Well, good morning once again. It's great to be here and great to see everyone here as well. Um, we're going to continue in our study of, um, of miracles, the Holy Spirit, a little bit. This should wrap up um, this particular topic, but when we'll move on to some other things here next week, but some things we've left unfinished we wanted to cover today. So uh, before we get into all that, let's uh, go to our Heavenly Father with a word of prayer. Our Lord and Father, you have been good to us in so many ways and providing for us everything we need, and we're grateful we're able to be here this morning to study your word, to encourage one another, and to worship you. May we continue in our efforts to understand your word and understand it properly, not just understand it, but to make it a part of our lives and to live it out in the way we conduct ourselves and things we say and the things we do that help other people to see you through us, to see your love for all mankind, for salvation through your son, Jesus. May we continue in our growth and understanding uh, each and every day till we spend eternity with you. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. So last week, or actually I guess two weeks ago, we were talking about some of the um, spiritual gifts. And we talked about the idea that the Spirit provides a variety of gifts. We looked at some different scriptures on that. And we looked at the fact that these were provided for the common good. These gifts weren't given just so somebody could be puffed up and so they could use them for their own personal use but it was meant to be used for the church. Um, some of the gifts were very much miraculous. Uh, many of them were. And there were also some gifts that were not. So uh, we looked at those a little bit, okay? And we also looked at the fact that Jesus did a lot of miracles. Um, and the primary purpose for his miracles what was to cause people to believe, to show, I am Jesus, I am the Christ. I am who I say I am. I am from God. I am the Son of God. And the miracles confirmed that. Right. And he did many, many miracles. We don't have them all recorded, but as John pointed out, the ones that are recorded, so you might believe that he is the Christ. Yeah. You know, I was sitting down yesterday and I got on the TV and I, I looked, I was looking and I, I found that movie of Jesus of Nazareth, which I think is a very good one. Mm -hmm. But I watched it all the way through again. And it's, you know, all these things that were said that those Pharisees and, you know, they did, <laughs> they wanted nothing to do with, they wanted their own. Place. Yes. Yeah. He told him off for it too. He did. He did. Yeah. Um, but his miracles just, you know, you know, he said, if you don't believe me, believe the miracles. You know, yeah. Hi, come on in. Yes. Yeah. Come on in. Grab me over here. Yeah. Okay. We're just getting started. Yeah. But yeah, he did a lot of miracles. Um, but again, they were to show, cause people to believe in him. Right. Okay. What about the apostles? They did a lot of miracles and we have a lot they did not record. But yeah. they did a lot. But what was the purpose? Why did they do miracles? Same thing. Yeah. To confirm the word. Okay, yeah, confirm, confirm the word, right? I mean, they were not Christ, certainly. They were pointing to Christ. But the things that their miracles were proving, confirming the things they were saying, these things are from God, right? Okay. And we looked at like Matthew, Mark 16, 20, Acts 2, 43, Acts 4, 8 through 12, and Acts 5, 12. All, all these verses kind of point that same thing. They were doing these miracles all confirming the word which they are preaching, confirming that the gospel is true, that Jesus is the Christ, um, along with the fact they were using Old Testament scripture to prove that these things had to happen, yeah. But they did a lot of miracles, right? Okay. And so, they still they were doing it in front of the Jews, too. They were. I mean, they were doing a yeah. number of different miracles. Some of them were, you know... Some had already seen Jesus and been following. Exactly, around. yeah. But some of the miracles they did were just incredible. Like, I think one place talks about they were, you know, they, if people... Uh, what was it? The shadow of Peter cast on this. It was a heel and stuff. I mean, it was pretty yes. incredible stuff they were doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but they were doing miracles. Okay. And we, but we looked at the fact that looking at a broader sense of miracles, we looked at the fact that they're not normative. I mean, miracles go beyond the norms, right? I mean, that's why we call them miracles because they're not yeah. the normal processes that happen. Right. Um, so we see them, but God was doing miracles throughout history. I mean, starting from creation you know, all the way through, we see God doing miracles at different times um, throughout miracles. But when it came to men who were doing miracles, you know, people like the apostles and people like Moses and Elijah and so forth, all those, it seems like all of them occurred during the time the scripture was being written down. You know, we don't have any miracles, at least no recorded miracles happening outside that period of time in which all the scriptures are being written, which is kind of interesting. But it also fits with why were the apostles doing it? It was confirming the word, and they were busy writing the word in that first century. Right? And as we already pointed out, they were confirming the word. Um, let's look at Hebrews 2, 2 through 4, because that kind of sums up a lot of what we're talking about this morning or reviewing. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. We should read verse 1 as well to get the context here. It says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received is just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, the apostles. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So here again, we see that those signs, wonders, miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit were all confirming the word was being spoken, right? Okay. So, and we've now got the word, right? Um, so some of the gifts remain, others do not. Um, we looked at the fact in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, it talked about, you know, where there's, you know, prophecies, where they'll cease, we're speaking in tongues, those things are going to cease, that many of these gifts were no longer needed at some point, right? So we looked at that, okay? But towards the end of class then, we talked about the, the idea about what does the Bible say about these signs, wonders, and miracles? Um, because I, I asked the homework question, we'll get to just in a moment here about that. As I, as we read there in Acts chapter 2, uh, excuse me, um, not Acts 2, but um, um, Hebrews? Hebrews, yeah, talking about he did these great miracles and signs and wonders and so forth. We see this language being used, and we see it several places. Um, 2 Corinthians 2.12, or 12.12, 12, the signs of the true apostles were performed among you with utmost patience with signs and wonders and mighty works. Or Acts 2.22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Um, Acts 14.3, so they remained a long time, speaking boldly to the Lord, who bore witness to his word, of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Um, and there's several places, these kind of things, these signs, wonders, and miracles. So my question for the homework assignment was, what's the difference between signs, wonders, and miracles? Or is there really any difference? Anybody do any looking into that? Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, very good. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the keys that all three of them, whether signs, wonder, mirror, they're all serving to kind of validate who God is and who Jesus is, right? Um, but there is some some minor distinctions, but oftentimes you'll see them lumped together because they're all have a certain kind of a central purpose, right? Anybody else do any work on that? Find anything? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. Um, we'll come back to the second question here in a minute, but I, I found this little chart um, that I thought was quite nice, and it kind of you know, condenses down what you're saying, but you did a really good job that we see the idea of a miracle being kind of these extraordinary events by divine power. I mean, these are things that are outside normal physical process. They superintend, you know, supersede them, if you will. Uh, great um, events and so forth. Um, wonders tend to be these things that evoke am amazing awe and wonder. You're just, wow, I mean, this is really incredible. Um, and signs tend to be something that's, that's signifying some sort of spiritual truth, right? That's kind of what they're, how you define it. And, and you see in their purpose, I mean, the miracles demonstrate divine intervention, that he was able to intervene in nature, um, such as Jesus walking on the water, or when he calms the storm. I mean, those are miracles, right? Um, the signs, they are signifying spiritual truths, and they tend to confirm divine messages. I mean, the apostles, the Jews were asking Jesus for a sign. He says, no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah, who was three days in the belly of the fish, so it's the Son of Man will be three days in the uh, belly of the earth, Right. It's a sign. It's confirming the message, right? Um, or we can, they didn't understand a lot of that. No, they didn't. But they understood the idea that, that God was leaving them a, a, a sign that he is still in control and so forth. Or think about the rainbow, right? God put that as a sign that he would never again flood the earth, right? 
So these are, you know, the idea of signs is pointing to a spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And oftentimes they may be miraculous in nature, but there's a purpose. Yeah, that's different. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh when the Lord Jesus was on the cross and God made darkness for three hours, yeah, that would be a sign. Yeah. Well, and certainly, yeah, the, certainly the darkness was a sign, and also the, the uh, curtain being torn in two mm -hmm. was clearly a sign. A sign, yeah. right? That you know that now access has been provided um, through Christ to the Holy to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah. So we see these kind of things. Um, these signs are pointing to things. Um, I also think about like Gideon. Right, he asked for a sign. He says, "Let let the you know the dew be on the grass, but not on something else." Then reverse the next night. It was a sign. The lambskin. Yeah, right. The lambskin. Right. Exactly. Please, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we see these kind of signs, and then we see this idea of these wonders. These are just things that really evoke awe. I mean, they really highlight God's greatness. Um, like the parting of the Red Sea is like, whoa, you know, this is amazing. Or when Jesus calmed the storm. Remember the disciples' reaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are they're wonders and. They're miraculous in nature, but they evoke a little bit different uh, response, I guess. You know? So, um, you know, so all of that, so that's kind of oftentimes you'll read about all three together because they all point to God's divine power and his, his work and his word. Yeah. Okay. But they do carry a slightly different, you know, definition. Yeah. And he always did things at the appropriate time. Yeah. Too. Oh, yeah. 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 what was going on at the time so that, yeah. that sign would be there or that miracle yeah. or whatever, right yeah. i mean again we think about jesus did a lot of miracles i mean healing all these different people and so forth yeah um showing his his divine intervention his greatness and so forth yeah so okay so good so yeah it's just it's just good to kind of keep keep that in mind there are differences but oftentimes you'll read as we did they're often lumped together because they're all pointing to who god is and who christ is yeah all right so that was one question I had. The other question I was, so how was miracle working passed along in the New Testament? We clearly saw that the apostles did miracle working, but we also read, particularly in the book of Acts, we read there were other people who did miracles as, as well. Where did they get their power to do miracles? Did God just, you know, randomly pick people? So they on the hands. Okay. The apostles, they lay hands on somebody, then that person... And also, okay, miracle. okay, Romans 1 11. Okay, yeah, Romans 1 11 is one verse we can look at. Okay, Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. Okay, Paul here writing to the Romans, the, the Christians in Rome says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So Paul said he's going there to impart some sort of spiritual gift. Okay. And as we and saw, but if if they could pray and ask for it like they say you can today, um, Paul wouldn't have had to make the trip. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, apparently there was a need for him to go there to impart that it, it didn't come, you know, by another means. Okay. So that's one. Okay. Is there other scriptures anybody found? Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, yes, that's a good one. And it's a, that's one we'll probably spend some time in because it's probably one of the, the best ones. Um, I've actually got a, a slide here um, that covers a lot of these things, right? Um, before I get into Acts 8, I want to kind of walk us through to get to that point, a couple of things to kind of back it up. In Acts chapter 1, um, this is kind of review what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, in Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, uh, he said, and this is Jesus speaking, and he's talking to his disciples, his apostles, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, so he's telling them they're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit is going to come on and they're going to receive power. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we read about the actual coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, where it's made just a sound, you know, like thunder, and the, you know, the Spirit descending like flames of fire appearing on people, and the apostles being able to speak in tongues. We see that fulfilling of what Jesus said. They got that power. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, after Peter's explained what's going on and talks about 
that Jesus is in fact the Christ that they had crucified in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, is that everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. So here again is a reference to the fact that they're doing miracles. They're doing these miraculous signs, okay, confirming the word. So we have this going on. And then in Acts chapter 5, this is important for a background to Acts chapter 8 we'll get to. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, just read this. Um, again, we see the apostles perform many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the people used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. So again, a reference to the fact they're doing um, a lot of miracles. And then dropping down to verse 15 and 16, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them and as he passed by. Um, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick, those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. So, yeah, there were a lot of miracles being done by the apostles. We see this, okay? Mm -hmm. And then when we get to chapter 6, um, this is the be a good background of chapter 8. Acts chapter 6 and starting in verse 5. Um, the occasion here is that the um, there's been a daily distribution of food. And there, apparently the Grecian um, Jews were being overlooked in this daily distribution. And the apostles said, well, it's not good for us to neglect the ministry of the word, you choose seven men to, um, to take care of this work. And so this is what we um, see in verse 5. And this proposal, this idea to choose seven people to do this work, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Okay. Um, so the word of God spread. Number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. So here we see Stephen is one of these seven that's chosen. We see the apostles laying their hands on him, and now Stephen is doing miracles and wonders, as we saw the apostles doing. Okay, But there's six other men there as well they placed their hands on. Okay. So all this serves as a good backdrop then as we get into Acts chapter 8, which was referenced. So let's go there to Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Those who had been scattered, um, so the occasion here is we get the context, is that um, Stephen, the man we just read about, um, had preached a lesson to the Jews about Jesus the Christ, but the Jews didn't like to hear it, and they stoned him, including Saul, who became Paul, but they stoned Stephen and killed him. And a persecution broke out against the Christians at that point. So a lot of the Christians who were in Jerusalem now are scattering. And that's what we read about in verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, so now here's Philip, another one that, of that seven uh, that the apostle laid their hands on. He's doing miraculous signs. They all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So he's doing a lot of miracles. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the, is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So again, we see these miracles he's doing. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah, so yeah, quite an incredible story there, right? 
So we, we see Philip is doing miracles, but apparently he couldn't pass that along. But when Peter and John, apostles came, they laid hands on people and suddenly they could do miracles, right? And Simon, who'd been doing all this magic stuff, thought he was pretty good stuff. He thought, wait, I'd like to be able to do that as well. <laughs> um, but he saw where it came from. It came from the apostles. He said, I want to be able to do that too. Yes. Yeah, Peter wasn't particularly complimentary. No, we can read verse 20 as a follow-up to that. Yes, as Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he'll forgive you for having such a thought uh, in your heart. For I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. And Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Uh, when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Okay. Yeah. This is probably the clearest passage that shows that that ability to do miracles passed on by the apostles laying their hands on people. Okay. And that they could do miracles. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard it said, and if this is true, this is probably one of the, the most harshest or, you know, strictest rebukes. Is when Peter said, your money perished with you, he was telling Simon, you and your money go to hell. Yeah, in, in effect, yeah. But yeah, you've got the wrong wrong heart and wrong attitude here, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. hard. It that's is, yeah, point. yeah. But, but it points to the fact, I mean, that's, you know, that, that God wants our hearts, that we're to be, you know, a man after his heart, right? In order, the gift, he wanted the gift, why? Because he wanted to be somebody great and powerful for himself. But, God is doing that for the good of, as we've seen, it's to be used for the good of other people, not for our own selves. Right? That's Jesus cool. himself didn't use those uh, merit, miraculous powers for his own personal use. Um, you know, so, yeah. But this is a, um, a pretty clear passage on that. Um, now, the one thing that, that, um, that people may argue here, and I don't know if argue is the right term, but they may come back and say, wait a minute, didn't we study a couple of weeks ago that the that we get the Holy Spirit when we're baptized into Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling. How come then in this passage, he uses they could receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say gifts of the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit here. But how do we reconcile that? Keith, you're going to say something? Right? When the Holy Spirit comes is given at our baptism for forgiveness, he comes within. Okay. But it specifically says there that the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon yeah, okay. So there's a difference between within and upon. Yeah, and in verse 16, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they'd simply been baptized, okay? Okay. Yeah. So there is that idea, right, that it said it had come upon them, yeah. But in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, when you're baptized, repent and be baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling, which we looked at um, last week as well. Um, but here... But the point is that sometimes he uses that, that language of the, the Holy Spirit in, when he's trying to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that ability to do miracles is the gifts. That's not the, not the same as the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling. The gifts are different, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the miraculous gifts in particular are different, okay? And what we see is this is actually um, a common, if I make this work here, there we go. Um, it's actually what we call a metonymy. This is a figure of speech. Uh, Luke uses this quite frequently in the book of uh, Acts, and we're actually quite familiar with it, just we, sometimes we don't think about it. But a metonymy is where you substitute the name of an attribute or an adjunct for that thing meant. For example, we might talk about a suit when we mean a business executive, or we might talk about a track for horse racing. We use a word that substitutes for something else. You know, Maybe you read in the paper or you hear in the news, the White House said, well, the White House itself did not speak. We recognize it's talking about the president, right? But we use that kind of language, right? Um, you know, here's a couple examples. I wish he'd keep his nose out of, out of the plans, right? <laughs> right? I mean, we know that nose isn't meant to be used literally there, yeah. right? It's an autonomy, right? It means you're, 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 you've got your poking into my business, right? Um, and so we use that kind of thing, right? Or I could say this class is more intelligent and engaged than the last one, right? Well, the class is the, you know, 
fundamentals of Christianity. Well, no, it's not that. It's the students, right? It's the people. But we use the word class to refer to that. That's metonymy. We, we do this all the time, and sometimes we don't even think about it. But the Bible uses that as well, right? Um, to give you some examples, um, Acts chapter, and we actually read this one already, um, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Um, we went through this. So the word of God spread, okay? Well, it was, this wasn't yet written. What was, what was spreading? Yeah, it was the knowledge, right? It was, it was speaking of it, right? Okay. Um, or in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, we're reading there as well. Um, it says, um, when the apostle in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. Well, when we talk about Samaria, are we talking about the city and all those buildings? Or are you talking about the people, right? So again, it's metonymy. We're using one, but we clearly see that, right? Or we could read in Acts chapter 8, 28, since we're already there. Um, it says, and on his way home, and on his way home, he was sitting in the prophet, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Um, you know, he was reading, he was reading Isaiah. He was, he was reading the words of Isaiah. He wasn't reading Isaiah, right? I mean, I can't read Paul. I read the words of Paul, right? Okay. Um, so we see these kind of things. But then even if we go back to I'm gonna, um, yeah, Acts 21, 21 is another one. And these aren't the only ones, but just to give you a sense that this type of language is in the Bible, and sometimes we skip over it. But I, I want to make a point of it here because some people um, may miss this. Uh, for instance, Acts 21, 21, um, they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. Uh, turn away or forsake Moses. Well, it's not Moses they're forsaking. It's the law that Moses wrote using Moses to refer to the law, right? It's metonymy, yeah. right? Okay. Um, or if we go back to Acts chapter 2, where Peter's preaching um, on the day of Pentecost there, um, we referred to earlier in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, it says, they're exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So did they were they seeing and hearing the Spirit or were they seeing and hearing the results of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit? The Spirit itself is invisible, but they're seeing the manifestation. But he's using the word Spirit to refer to manifestation of the Spirit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when Paul, when Luke is writing there in Acts chapter 8, you know, and he's recording these things, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, that miraculous ability, even though he's just using the word Holy Spirit, he's talking about the gifts. It's metonymy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does it make sense? We see another example of this um, type of thing in Acts chapter 19 as well. For seven verses here. Luke writes, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. Okay. So here's another um, example of you know, the Holy Spirit and Paul placing his hands on them, and they get the ability to prophesy and speak in tongues, okay? If they didn't have the indwelling already, he yeah. didn't need to baptize them again. Correct, so yes. He, I mean, he did both of them. He did he both, did yeah. So, so that's the, again, we see this idea. The first place he's asking, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the indwelling? And so, well, we don't even, we've not even heard there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about, Paul? He says, well, wait a minute. Then what baptism did you get? Because... Peter taught when you repent and are baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So if they've got indwelling. right, so if they've got, they've got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then where's the baptism? So that's what he asked the question. Well, what baptism did you receive then? Mm -hmm. Well, we got John's baptism. And if you read in Acts chapter 18, you'll find Apollos, who was referenced there in verse 1, he initially didn't know about the baptism of Jesus. He just knew about John's, and that's what he's preaching. And these people had heard that. So two Paul, different two different things. John's baptism and the baptism of Christ, two different things. 
So these men said, well, we were baptized under John's baptism. Ah, oh, that explains it. John's baptism was meant to point to Christ. Now that Christ has been here, so Paul then baptized them in Christ, and then he placed their hands on them, and they get these miraculous powers. But they also would have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some people get that mixed up a lot, you know? Yeah. They think it's the same thing sometimes. Yeah, but there is a difference. And that's why we spent some time kind of going over this metonymy and looking at that last week. Yeah. That there is a difference there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. And we've already looked at Romans 1.11. Um, there's one more that we need to look at in this context because it brings up another potential question that people have. Um, and some people say, well, you're contradicting yourself. So we want to look at 2 Timothy, first and 2 Timothy, for just a couple moments here. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 first. So Paul, the apostle, is writing this. He's writing it to Timothy, who is a young evangelist, uh, both first and second Timothy written to the same person. In verse six of chapter one, he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now it doesn't say what the gift is, but Paul said, you received a gift when I laid my hands on you. You got a gift, so it's fan it into flame, you know, use it, right? In first Timothy chapter four, and I think it's actually supposed to be chapter verse 14, that is verse 12, I Forgot to correct that. Yes, that should be 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, not 12. And we could actually read from verse 12 through 14 to get the context here. Paul writes again to Timothy, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech and life and love and faith and impurity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, Paul said in one place, he laid his hands on him. Here he says the elders laid his hands on him. Oh, well, now what do we got going on here? Right? Laying on the hands. <laughs> Laying on the hands, okay. Um, so, did the elders have the ability to lay hands on him in part a gift? Is that what that's saying? They may yeah. have been with Paul when he laid okay. on the hands. But yeah, the power it's, was directed through Paul. Exactly. And this is where we need to, you know, dig a little deeper into the Greek a little bit. All right. So mm -hmm. in, in 2 Timothy 1 6, we read where Paul claimed, he basically claimed credit. Now let's go back and look at 2 Timothy 1 6 for, um, yeah, it says, which is in you through the laying on of my hand. Okay. So that through in the NIV comes from the Greek preposition dia, which means through or by means of, right? It came through Paul, by means of Paul's laying on his hands, it came there, okay? That's what that word means in that, in that sentence, okay? When we go to 1 Timothy 4.14, I did correct it in this one, we go back to chapter 4, verse 14, okay? Um, here, the NIV also used the word through. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message. Here, Paul included the eldership in the action. Here, it uses a different Greek preposition. It gets translated the same English preposition, but it's a different Greek preposition. In this case, it's the preposition meta. The root meaning is in the midst of, or the attendant circumstances, or somebody accompanying the phenomenon. Right? Okay, so it's something different. So for instance, let's say we were all on the bus and I'm driving the bus, right? And we get through a storm. You know, we got through the storm by means of my driving, but we, you got through the storm, you know, yeah. you accompanied me through the storm, right? That's the idea, right? We both went through the storm, but I was actually driving the bus. Here, Paul was the actual agent through which the gift came. The elders were there accompanying him, okay? So knowing, understanding the different Greek words helps us to see that even the same English word, two different Greek words and have two different meanings. So it's not saying the elders laid their hand and the gift came. They were there with Paul when that happened. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I actually have a note in my Bible, Paul, uh, Bob, that you uh, used the word endorsement back in 2014. You preached about this very thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, that's the idea. They were endorsing that they were a with or a company, as the word says here, yeah. Witnesses. Yeah, exactly, they're witnesses to it. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, so in other words, Paul, as an apostle, imparted the miraculous gift to Timothy. It came from God through Paul. 
Um, however, on that occasion, the local eldership, the church was present, participated, lending their support and accompanying commendation. Okay. Um, conclusion, after examining the grammatical data on the matter, Nicole concluded it was the imposition of the hands of St. Paul that was the instrument used by God in the communication of the charisma or gifts to Timothy. Consequently, 1 Timothy 4.14 provides no proof that miraculous capability could be received other, through other means in addition to apostolic imposition of hands and the two clear instances of Holy Spirit baptism. Um, this comes from Dave Miller or um, from Apologetic Press. And I have a copy of the full article if you want that background information and more. I have a copy of that article here, and you're more than welcome to pick that up after class. Okay. All right. In case somebody runs across it, laying on the hands is not always be restricted to transferring gifts. Absolutely. Absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, In fact, I was I'm just going to kind of touch oh. on that a little bit. So, very good segue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we've been focusing in on how in the world did the people do miracles, right? Mm -hmm. And it's clear that the apostles were given that gift to do miracles, but they could also lay hands on people to do miracles as well, okay? So when we kind of summarize this, right? All these signs and wonders and miracles, all these things always point back to God and pointing to the fact that Jesus is a Christ. All of these were done for that purpose, right? The apostles were certainly able to pass along this gift but what would happen when the apostles died? That's a good question, right? Okay, yeah. Well, the, the gifts that had been given to other brethren remain functional, but the ability for them to be passed on stopped. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, we see no clear indication whatsoever that the people who received that gift could pass it along, right? Very clear when we looked at that passage, Acts chapter 8, that Philip couldn't, but the apostles could do it. So when the apostles died, whoever had those gifts, they could keep doing them. But once they died, then that would... It is, is the idea that they weren't needed then at that time? That, that seems to be what we see, yes. Yeah. That's what yeah. Um, you know, that... So, yeah, so miracle, you know, that type of miracle working would phase out. Because mm -hmm. the apostles died, the people they laid their hands on, as they died, that, that would phase out. Okay, and you know, history confirms this too. I mean, you go back and look and read at some of the church fathers, you know, first, second, third century church people. They'll they'll say that's what happened. You know, the miracle working basically faded out by the start of the third century. People, you know, the last one that may have been touched by John in the end of the first century might have lived in maybe a hundred years. Well, they were all sewing the sea of the king. They're sewing the same, yeah, the right, Christ, yeah. Yeah, and the word, by that time, the word had already all been written. It was being distributed. So there wasn't sure. as need to confirm it with the miracles, right, as we've yeah, been seeing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, do you think then that people cannot be given that gift now? Yeah, I don't, I don't think people have that, um, the gift to do miracles like they did in the first century. Now, the next point, though, God is still able to work miracles, right? Mm -hmm. He could still do miracles. I mean, we, we read about and hear about people who said, I went to the doctor and he said, I got cancer. And I went back two weeks later, if we prayed and I had no cancer stuff. Well, you know, that God's working, you know, he could still do those kind of things, but I don't think he works in the same way that people had that ability to do miracles on command. Yeah. But God can still do miracles. Yeah. He does what's yeah. best. He does what's Always. best. Yeah. Always. Yeah. So, yeah. A few years ago, I did some research on miracles. Mm -hmm. There was a man in Portland, Oregon, who had been a, a police officer and he'd been, I think, uh, investigating drugs and capturing dealers and stuff. Anyway, it took its toll on him emotionally and he just burned out. And he, his health was also in trouble and he developed macular degeneration and they had the pictures mm -hmm. of the blotches, mm -hmm. you know, so he only had peripheral vision. And uh, when, long story short, he, got involved in porn and stuff and he went to a men's conference and he he decided that during that conference he was convicted and so he decided to pray and he asked God to just take the garbage out of his mind mm -hmm. he wasn't even asking for healing mm -hmm. but he but he got his sight back right there mm -hmm. and he went and told the state of Oregon I don't need to be on welfare anymore because I can see and they didn't believe him. Mm -hmm. I mean, they thought you faked you faked the macular mm -hmm. degeneration. And he said, "No, I didn't." Yeah. 
and they have all the doctor's yeah. confirmations and pictures and diagnosis and all that. And the, uh, the state of Oregon spent almost a year trying to prosecute him, and finally they gave up. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe in miracles through prayer, but it, God's the one that decides. God, yeah, God's the one. That, yeah, we don't. Yeah, there's he's things. Still that, able to do them. He's there's no question. He's still oh, yeah. able to do them. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Because I was the recipient of somebody seeing a broken collarbone when the doctor said I'm treating me for something in my body. Yeah. I yeah. raised my arm yeah. and I went to a service at a church and there was a woman there who was laying hands on and she said, I can see the rope and collarbone. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the doctor and I was telling him and he said, oh no, not possible. I said, well, what's this little bump on my collarbone then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no. So yeah. something happened, you know, it was... Yeah. Yeah, there's people have all sorts of stories. I mean, yeah, God is yeah. still able to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 no, yeah. Um, we need to see yeah. the see what yeah. was accomplished. Right, so. but what we see it written down is He had a specific purpose for those miraculous works in that first century yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that was so. Yeah, I hosted yeah. a couple one time, and they had come there for a retreat, and anyhow, they said that this man had walked into church and he said, "I want you to heal me." And the elders were sitting around. They said, well, you know, looked at one another said, okay, well, okay. They, so they started to pray for him. He said, the man's arm had been broken. And they, find, they as they prayed for him, they got saw the arm straighten out. Mm -hmm. And so it was... Yeah. It was yeah. It was, they, yeah. they weren't really believing that it could happen. Right. And yet they had been... He demanded, demanded that they do something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like I say God can still do whatever yes, he wants God to do. Still, yeah. So, yes. yeah. Okay. But even in the New Testament, we read of, um, uh, you know, there's places where they didn't do miracles. You know, I mean, if you look at, uh, we're in, I'm in first Timothy, I've got a first Timothy five, verse 23. Um, to stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Well, why didn't he just heal him? Paul, could, you know, heal him. But, yeah. you know, so miracles weren't always used. Um, you know, or 2 Timothy 4.20 is another example. Um, let's see. Yeah, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Troph uh, Trophimus sick in Miletus. Well, why in the world did Paul leave him sick there? Why didn't he heal him? Paul could certainly heal people. So, I mean, miracles are being done, but it doesn't mean that, you know, there were times that miracles, they weren't used. So, um, you know, we, we got to keep in mind, you know, what God's purpose was in doing miracles. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Paul himself. Uh, yeah. It is believed that his thorn in the flesh was blindness. Yeah. Because I think of some references in Galatians, but... He besought the Lord three times, and the Lord said, "No." No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. God said, "Nope. My my grace is sufficient for you." Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So we. I mean, we see examples of this, right? That it wasn't always. Um, you know, there were miracles certainly being done, but there was purpose to them. Okay. All right. Well, as Bob, as we close out class today, then the question came up that we've looked at the idea of laying on of hands, you know, for passing along, but there were other occasions. What other occasions? Why else were people laying their hands on people? Okay. So that'll be kind of our, our question for next week. Um, where we're going um, is that turn in your Bible to Hebrews. We close up class, turn to Hebrews chapter six. Um, but I want to show you where we're going in the coming weeks. It's kind of, we're actually in this piece now. <clears throat> Acts chapter, excuse me, I say Acts, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, not Acts. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. God permitting, we will do so. Where we're going in the coming weeks is, is this passage right here. We're going to look at these foundational things. So we've started into that, looking at this idea of laying on the hands. We're going to look at baptism. We're going to look at judgment. We're going to look at resurrection. Uh, some of these topics um, is kind of where we're going. 
Um, so I wanted to give you that. So for next week, if you want to investigate and see what other reasons were people laying on hands besides what we've talked about today, and okay, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Okay. Oh, and they put the elders in. So. Yeah. So yeah, go go find those references. And see, you know, yeah. there was more than one purpose for laying on of hands. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And if you want to look in the Old Testament, you can as well. Yeah. See what was going on. All right. So in closing. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.